Are they really? Are they going to? All right. It is 2 o'clock. We are going to get started with the presentations for Aggies and Vin. Let me uh, please, yeah, you, everybody sit down. We're all excited here. I mean, everybody's really getting going. And so, what's the matter? Don, what are you saying? Okay. All right. We're going to get going. We're going to get started with Aggies and Vent. My name is Rodney Bain, and I started the whole weekend talking with y'all about this whole how to become successful in an Aggies and Vent. And one of the things that I told you was is that at 4 o'clock on Friday, 2 o'clock today was going to seem like four hours from then. And most of you didn't believe me. Well, do you believe me now? Yes. yes. All right. Yeah, it's pretty amazing how quick time flies. And so that's the whole thing that we've been working on with y'all throughout this entire weekend. You have done a tremendous job throughout this entire weekend. It has been phenomenal, everything that you've done. You have progressed dramatically. You've made great strides in your product. You've made great strides in your solution. Now it's time to convince everybody what you have done. We'll be giving this presentation, as we talked about, we'll have you as an opportunity to give the presentation. There'll be a 10 minute timer in the back. It'll count down from 10 minutes down to zero when you start. I'll stop you at 10 minutes if you haven't finished by that time. And then also, we'll have in the back of the room, you'll see some what's called confidence monitors. When it comes time for the judges, for them to ask questions, they're gonna pop up on the confidence monitors and you'll get a chance to hear them as well as they will see you and they will also then be able to put this together. They're on Zoom, but we're broadcasting this to YouTube. So you'll get a chance to review your presentation and get a chance to figure out exactly how you've done in all the presentations. At the end of all the presentations, I'm gonna walk out for just a few minutes and I'm gonna spend some time talking with the judges. Y'all will go out and go get a group shot and then we will come back in and announce the winner. Again, it's been phenomenal for you to be able to be here. We have enjoyed working with you so tremendously, and it's something that we are very much looking forward to, seeing your final presentations. I also want to let you know that if you're interested in continuing to work on these, Engineering Entrepreneurship has an incubator that's up on the fourth floor. We're happy to help you continue working. So let's work together and turn these into something that might be commercializable if that's what you're interested in. All right? And there is money available to help you do that through the various programs that we have. We'll talk more about those in just a few minutes. I'm going to ask the judges to come up online and go ahead and turn on their video and audio and ask their judges to introduce themselves so that you can get a chance to meet all of them. We have four outstanding judges. Marianne, do you want to get started? Sure, hello, my name is Marianne Johnson. I work at Los Alamos National Laboratory in the Finance Center for Innovation, which is the Technology Transfer Division for the lab. Obi? Fine, the mute button. Hey, right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Obi S. Horgy. I'm a manager in our Accenture's Utilities Consulting Practice. This is third, maybe fourth year, maybe a little longer than that, uh, I've been involved with Aggies and Vent, and uh, I'm very excited to see the presentation that we've got today. Uh, and yeah, congrats, good luck, everyone. All right, Evelyn, I think you might be having difficulty with your video, so if you could chime in and introduce yourself, I'd appreciate it. Oh, there you are, yay! Hi, I'm Evelyn Mullen from Alcalis National Laboratory. I am the Chief Operating Officer for our Global Security Directorate, where we do a lot of national security work related to um, nuclear non-proliferation, space stations or detonation detection, um, and other um, space-based missions, nuclear engineering, uh, intelligence, lots of things, very interesting work. And so uh, when I saw the problem statements for this event, I thought, well, this would be very interesting to participate in and judge. So happy to be here. Um, my technical problem is I can't see the presentation. Like, uh, all I see is a black screen on my side. So. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. All right, 
Um, if need be, log into the YouTube channel and, and you can watch it there. It'll be a little bit delayed, but you can watch it there. Ryan, how about you? All right, I'll, I'll round us out here. So, Ryan Sather, I'm a partner at Accenture. Um, I've been with uh, Accenture for, I guess, 23 years now, primarily in our utilities practice. Um, specialized for a long time in nuclear power, um, the work we do there. But this is uh, my second time of getting to, to, to judge this, and it's, it, it was a, such a pleasure the first time. I'm really looking forward to your, your team's presentation today. So. With that, I'll hand it back to you, Ryan. All right, Ryan, thank you so much. And judges, thank you so much for everything that you've done. Well, without further ado, let's get our first team up here. The first team is Kraken. We'll get your presentation uploaded and, and ready to go. And then uh, we'll turn it over to you in just a few minutes. Engineer. Hi, I'm Matthew Coombs. I am also a freshman engineer. Uh, I'm Anthony Lustin, freshman physics. I'm Constantine Nelson, freshman engineer. Howdy, I'm Devin. I'm a freshman engineer. And we are Kraken. Humanity is a species of explorers. We gaze out into the universe we live in and can't help but wonder what more there is. We use our senses to try to make sense of it. Our observations lead us to understanding. We then use that understanding to augment our ability to observe. We build telescopes, microscopes, sensors, and scanners. Every step that we can make towards increasing the resolution with which we can see the world is a step closer to conquering it. Every facet of modern life is built on our ability to accurately see the world. We are at the brink of physical understanding, where an increase in the accuracy of our measurements could discover new particles, unlock new theories, and ultimately lead us to new questions. Satellite constellations, taking extremely precise measurements, provide a new frontier for our discovery. CubeSats, which are small experimental satellites that can house a variety of sensors, have encouraged new entities to pursue cutting-edge research on account of their low-cost and pre-approved convenience. Even with the means of research being more available than ever before, we can't accommodate many of the central instruments needed for these measurements. This is because superconductors, which are used in many high-precision low-orbit sensors, require temperatures near absolute zero to operate effectively. This is where cracking comes in. As we mentioned in our video, currently there are no thermal control systems that operate near this um, absolute zero temperature that is needed for these sensors to get those precise measurements on those satellite-based experiments. And so this is the problem we are trying to solve. And before moving on, we just want to define a term because we'll use the term CubeSats a lot. And so as we mentioned in the video, these are small-scale satellites that operate in a low Earth orbit and they can house a variety of sensors to collect data. Our goal is to enable precise data collection over the duration of a CubeSats lifespan, which would be about one year, and it needs to be able to accommodate these really low temperature sensors. So we had several requirements going into this. The first is that the sensor itself needed to maintain a temperature of four degrees Kelvin. We also needed it to fit within a 1.5 U space, which for reference is about that big. It's 10 by 10 by 15 centimeters. We also had to keep the power consumption below 28 watts, which is the minimum power outage of uh, the solar panels that we use. We also needed to measure temperature inside the apparatus and adjust it accordingly. And we needed it to last the duration of the satellite's lifespan, which is approximately a year. 
during our brainstorming, we went through three main ideas for, for our cooling method. And it, well, the, our first one was black body radiators attached directly to the, to the instrument. Uh, and we ran the numbers. It would only get down to 150 Kelvin, so it's not cold enough. We need to get colder. And so our second idea, we have liquid helium reservoir. This attaches directly to the chip and cools it as required. The problem with this, though, is as the helium heats up, you have to off-gas it into space, and eventually you run out of liquid helium, and that takes a couple days to a couple weeks, which is not long enough for our mission. So we come up with our final idea, which is an active cooling system, which takes the black body radiator from before, but now we have a cryo cooler uh, using the solar p power, and that, that uh, takes the heat from the chip and actively uh, moves it to the black body radiator. And on the left here, we have the, the radiator from on the satellite. On, on the inside, for the two right pictures, you can see the thermal management systems. So after the satellite is deployed, solar panels would fold out to create a heat shield. And, and then the radiator would fold out from the back. Uh, so currently, you can see the satellite pretty well, but actually, uh, it would be really dark. I added a light so you could see it because uh, it's fully obscured from the sun by the solar panel. And as it orbits around the Earth, the solar panels will always be facing directly at the sun for maximum efficiency and to completely block the backside of the satellite. Uh, and as it orbits around the Earth, it'll experience a wide range of temperatures and need to accommodate for all of those different uh, situations. Another passive system we use is a black body radiator. And one of the largest issues that we had was that there's no air in space. So we needed a medium to transfer through where there was no medium. So we decided to opt for a black body radiator, which transforms the thermal energy into infrared waves. So the way the cryogenic cooler works is by expansion and contraction of a gas, and it manipulates that all the way until uh, as cold as you need, which is 4 Kelvin in this case. And so in order for that to happen, we need a gas which can get down to 4 Kelvin. And the only one that can do that is, li or is helium. And so that's what we use inside the cryo cooler. And so we ran the numbers. We only needed 8 watts of cooling power, uh, which is well within our budget, of, within our solar panel budget. And the reason it's so little, relatively, is because we isolated our, our cooling system from the chassis. And so this, this, like the sun, it hits the chassis, it heats it up, but, and so normally it would conductively heat the cooling system. It doesn't happen anymore because it's, it's isolated, and so now the cooling system can get a lot colder than before. One of the most advantageous aspects of an active cooling system is the ability to accurately change the temperature of the device. Um, and that, differs from solely mechanical means because mechanical means can't, uh, can't as accurately do it. So that is important because in space, the, so the, the rate of cooling is actually uh, dependent upon the position around the Earth. So for example, if it's like directly in front of the sun, then it will need a much higher rate of cooling than if it was behind the Earth. So what you see up there is a prototype system and it demonstrates accurate temperature regulation. So it works right here through a switch that changes based on the temperature received from a thermal resistor. And that thermal resistor works by the same mechanism that will be used in our cryogenic system. So using thermodynamics, we're able to calculate what the temperature of the satellite would be uh, based on the amount of radiation that's coming in. So in order to be able to maintain this four degree Kelvin uh, that we need for the sensor, <clears throat> we need to balance the amount of radiation going into the chip uh, with the amount of radiation being pumped out by the cryo cooler. So using a thermodynamic model, we'll be, we're uh, able to produce a graph of what this should look like. So as you can see, as the external temperature of the chassis increases, the amount of power that we require to cool down the chip also increases. So we can see that around 370 Kelvin, um, we're gonna cross the threshold where the amount of power we require is more than can be provided by the satellites, uh, by the solar panel array. So luckily for us, our satellite operates at around 290 Kelvin, which is well below this threshold. So it tells us that 
as far as an energy budget goes, our design is quite promising. So our solution is very competitive because currently there is nothing else on the market that is able to cool down to that near absolute zero temperature that's needed for a 1.5U system. We also have a cross-functional system because you can, you can use it with many different sensors including the uh, superconductor ones like infrared radiation and x-ray detectors. We also focused on modularity because our system can add on to any similar sized CubeSat. That way we can focus in on having a wider customer base with that. This also is a growing industry right now, so we have that in our favor because currently there are actually over half of the satellites in orbit around the Earth are Cube satellites, and there's also an increasing um, emphasis on having that precise data. So going forward, we want to determine if there's a multi-stage cryo-cooler system that would work more effectively within our given space constraints. We also looked at a swarm of CubeSats. And so this is basically taking multiple CubeSats and having them all deployed at once so that we can create a constantly updating map of Earth's magnetic field, for instance. And this is actually something that NASA is looking to do in March of 2022. So again, this is very relevant. We also want to determine the most optimal material for black body radiation. Team Kraken, thank you very much. All right, outstanding, great job. And judges, you now have five minutes for questions. As soon as we get your screen up. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Go to the center camera. There we go. And here come the judges. All right, judges, you have five minutes for questions. I uh, appreciate the presentation. Uh, I definitely learned a lot in the last few minutes, so that's off to you. Uh, um, I guess my question starts out probably, you know, what's, what's the cost feasibility of this, and uh, you know, do you guys have any preliminary uh, numbers or recommendations on how this is actually a scalable solution to the problem? Rachel. Sure, I can feel this question. So looking at different aspects that will go into this, we estimate that it'll be about 5,000, but we do believe that it could be lower than this. So looking, we would definitely look more into the specifics of it, but generally somewhere between the four to $5,000 range. And that's especially if we get into mass production of this modular system. That is only for though the, the part of the system that we produce. The rest of the satellite is produced by a third party and that, that, along with the launch costs, uh, are more than 5000 Got it. So that seems like a reasonable number, I guess, relative to the, you know, to the benefit. Is this something that, you know, that you gave some initial numbers on how any satellites are going out and it's going to become more, more prevalent thing for research? Uh, is, that, is that a you know, small amount or is that, uh, that you know, large addition to what the manufacturer is already have? satellites so if you're if you're producing a swarm of satellites you'd need several hundred in order to be able to do something like you know a map of Earth's magnetic field so of course that's gonna it's gonna add up um, for each and every satellite that you do have to launch um, but is a single satellite cost that is actually relatively low in the market okay, okay. thank you any other questions so I have a question. Oh, go ahead, Edwin. Oh, okay, sorry. And, and now I can see you, but I can't get my camera to work. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Um, my question was, have you thought about whether or not you could expand your solution beyond, beyond the one and a half you um, keep that? We could. In fact, that would make it a lot easier and more feasible to make. Um, because we'd have more space for, for like cooling systems. And like I might have said this in the presentation, we could perhaps implement a, a helium reservoir, depending on the situation, because the, the limiting factor of the reservoir is it runs out too fast. So if you have a bigger reservoir, it'll take longer to run out. And if it runs out longer than the life of the, the satellite, then that's not the limiting factor anymore. But, and, and that would 
definitely reduce costs as well. Um, but yeah, it, it could definitely be scaled to bigger satellites. So one of the things you said there wasn't anything in our market that did this now. How do they address this problem currently? So currently, any satellite that wants to be able to uh, operate at superconducting temperatures needs to be much larger, of course. Uh, I know the James Webb Space Telescope does have some uh, instruments that need to operate at these temperatures. So they need a relatively large reservoir of liquid helium, which is, of course, being off-gassed into space. Um, but the reason ours is different is because it is able to fit on these small 1.5 U cube sets. And part of the reason we can do that is we do have that closed cycle, so we're not going to have to off-gas like uh, other systems do. All right, Kraken, it looks like you've stumped the judges. Congratulations. Uh, you know, uh, and thank you very much. I appreciate it. Great job. And I'll take this now. All right, we're going to give the judges just a couple of minutes to fill out the scoring. But Centos, if y'all want to come on up here and get ready and get comfortable, we will be ready for your team in just a couple of minutes. Like I said, we're going to give the judges just a few seconds to fill in. While they're getting ready, I just want to also recommend that you get a chance to connect and continue to maintain contact with your mentors and with the mentors that are going on. And the reason is because they're interested in continuing to connect with you. Reagan, you'll need to put it in presentation mode. Um, so y'all make sure that you get a chance to stay in contact with your mentors if you can. Go on Teams, we'll leave it up there so you get a chance to take a look at it and thank them. But thank them for all the time that they've been here. I know that the interaction has been tremendous with uh, everybody that y'all have had throughout the entire weekend. So get a chance to say thank you to them. And also get a chance to connect with some of the other mentors and some of the other judges. That way they get a chance to really uh, gain value out of what you're doing. All right, I have talked long enough now, and I think I'm going to turn this all over to Centos because I know that our judges are fast. All right. Howdy. 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 My name is Brandon Eifer. I am a junior nuclear engineer. Hello, I'm Tom Stegier. I'm also a nuclear engineer, and I'm a first year grad student. Hi, my name is Arthi Adeklovan. I'm an economics major, and I'm a senior. Hi, my name is Jewel Rickers. I'm currently a senior and I'm studying industrial distribution. Hi, I'm Gordon Gu. I'm majoring in mechanical engineering and I'm the first year graduate student. Hey y'all, my name is Kai Mariello and I'm a senior nuclear engineering student. And like many of you, I genuinely struggle using my microwave to heat up food properly. I undercook my ramen more times than I can count and my hot pocket is so hot it burns my mouth. Why does this happen? Well, to understand why this happened and why it's so complex, we have to understand how heat transfer works. What is heat transfer? Heat transfer is the ability to transfer energy and it describes the flow of heat due to temperature differences. Heat transfer has many applications which include air conditioning units that you use on a hot summer day, power plants that supply power to the power grids, and microwaves that you use to heat up food in your kitchen. Microwaves work by producing a form of radiation called microwaves. These are waves of energy that bounce around the interior of the oven. These waves will interact with anything that's placed inside the oven, such as food. The waves cause the water molecules to move around and bump into each other resulting in an increase in thermal energy and your food being hot. The problem is, is that you have no way of knowing if your food was heated evenly throughout. But what if there was a way to tell if items were heated evenly in a microwave? Introducing Centos, a box lined with fiber optic cables that allows radiation to strike the working fluid inside from different angles. This causes the fluid in the box to heat up, which generates a signal that is then sent to the computer. The computer then plots the temperature in the box to ensure it is heated evenly. CentOS is innovation at its finest.
Like many of you, most of my experiences with microwaves comes from heating up food. And while this is a great application of the technology, it is far from the only scientific application that microwaves can be used for. However, for these more scientific applications, it is of vital importance to understand not only the temperature distribution, but the electromagnetic field distribution inside of the microwave. Therefore, to help understand this, our goal was to develop, to develop and design a way to measure and visualize the temperature throughout a given volume in the microwave. Using this temperature distribution, we would be able to make inferences about what the electromagnetic field looked like given the relationship between these two quantities. Now, why is this important? Well, one critical example is that by proving you have a uniform electromagnetic field, you can use a microwave to generate experimental data for turbulent flow simulations, which can then be used to verify computational methods. Our design needed to meet five requirements. First of all, we needed to display a 2D or 3D image. It's kind of our bread and butter. We need to visualize our temperature distribution. Number two, we need to measure temperature over time, so we need transient response. Number three, we need to minimize interference on the electromagnetic field. Number four, the, micro the microwave needs to work at 350 watts for 90 seconds. And fifth, our design needs to have the ability to, to detect surface temperatures on a 10 cubic centimeter volume. We needed to make some assumptions so that we ensure feasibility of our designs. So before we got into our design phase, we made a couple of assumptions. And the first assumption is that if temperature is evenly distributed, so is the electromagnetic field. And this is because of the mathematical relationship between temperature and electromagnetic field. Secondly, we assume that metals can be put in a microwave if they're properly developed and coded. This is so that we can be adaptable to different materials when it comes to the experiment. And lastly, we assume that in the given volume, there is a liquid or a solid within a known geometry and a material makeup so that we don't assume that there is no there's gas inside the object. We have done massive brainstormed our possible designs. Here's our three uh, prototypes. In our first prototypes, we'll use called rotation laser camera. The laser camera can accurately and detect the temperature of each single point on the surface of a cubic. However, the laser itself can hardly detect the whole space, uh, the whole um, the temperature distribution of the whole space. And in our second prototype, we'll use multiple thermal cameras. The thermal cameras can the thermal cameras can detect the temperature distribution on each side of the cubic. But however, the camera itself will also cause the huge impact on the microwave. And in our third prototype, we will cover all the surface on the cubic with the temperature sensors and then connect them with the cables and wires. But as you can see in the picture, there are lots of cables and wires which will make the system less reliable. So what did we do to combat some of these problems that we were having? We decided to go away from temperature probes and start using fiber optics. So what we did is we created a silicone shell that encases our material that we're trying to understand its temperature flow through. And that's going to then read our temperature, output the temperature data, and then through that into our computer, we've been able to plot, if you look on the far right, our third figure there is actually showing you temperature distribution over time. So one of the hardest and most critical design challenges in addressing this problem is that we had to find a way to measure the electric field by placing an object in it without disturbing it, which is essentially impossible. By placing an object in this field, you always have some disturbance. Imagine, for instance, that you were going to go outside to measure the temperature, and you're taking your measurement, but you realize you're producing a shadow over your thermometer. Obviously, your results are going to be affected by this shadow. Now, while I can turn myself to face the sun, a device in the microwave cannot turn itself to be outside of its own shadow. Therefore, we had to design a device that would not interfere with the field. And in our design, we came up with a product that produces minimal interference, is manufacturable, and is microwave safe. So we made sure to choose materials that would minimally interact with the microwaves in the oven, 
such that it was not attenuating field and it would just pass right through. In addition, our design was very manufacturable. So it makes use of already currently existing technologies so that we don't have to invent whole new systems to be able to build it. Our current plan would be to 3D print the silicon shell while embedding fiber optic cables throughout it. In addition, current fiber optic cables commercially exist which can take measurements with a spatial resolution of 0.65 millimeters. Therefore, depending on how many like windings you have around your system, you could potentially take thousands of measurement points which would be sufficient to prove that your field is either uniform or not uniform. And finally, in choosing our materials, we should make sure that they were microwave safe so that we wouldn't have any metal sparking or damage to either our system or the microwave itself. So what are future applications of CentOS? And most importantly, how can CentOS impact you? Currently, simulations for microwave experiments um, for microwaves that utilize simulations and experiments, CentOS is able to display um, data of temperature data in real time. CentOS can also uh, be used in vaccine research, where it can be used to um, for the where radiation is used to sterilize contaminants. And then lastly, it can be used in fusion research, where, um, to aid in fusion research um, from lab scale experiments. And there's so much more to come with that. Before we go into the future though, things we need to make on improvements are we need a working prototype, we need experimental validations to make sure that we're not actually interfering with what we're doing, and then we need to optimize it. So we're taking our design from good, better, to best. And together, we are CentOS. An innovation at its finest. We have our good. We would just like to take this opportunity to thank our event organizers, sponsors, and our mentors. Thank you. We're open for questions. All right, great. We'll get everything set up for, for questions here in just a couple of seconds. Uh, good job. And uh, there are some of our judges. So judges, you have five minutes for questions. <laughs> I'll maybe kick off this time. Uh, nice job, folks. It was a great presentation. Um, in just kind of the, the flyby, it seemed like software is part of the solution. And I just want to, want to understand that it, you didn't highlight that as much as I knew you'd hope to hear. But what, what role do you foresee software playing in, in regulating the temperature? So me and Gordon developed software scripts in Python and MATLAB to go ahead and interpret the data that we received from our device. From there, we used nodal analysis to basically extrapolate what the temperature inside the volume is as well. So. That is the role of our software. Okay, appreciate it. Do you have any other questions? I guess I'll go next. I'm unclear on how, so how would this be used inside the microwave or used inside the device that you're trying to measure the so essentially the device uh, per the need statement would be localized in a small region of the microwave where you are trying to ensure a uniform electromagnetic field. Uh, and the purposes of doing this really kind of vary depending on whatever the scientists or researchers are trying to experiment on. Uh, the kind of use case we went over specifically was that if you verify you have a uniform field, you can do turbulent flow uh, experimental simulations. So. Essentially what we would do is you have this in your volume of interest, and this is much bigger than would be the actual scale. And you fill it with a working fluid that you understand the properties of, and the microwaves would then jet, or, uh, deposit energy into the fluid and heat it up, which we could then detect across the entire or surface area of the fluid and also extrapolate into the volume of the fluid which would then allow us to use mathematical relationships to understand what the actual electromagnetic field itself looked like. That helps clarify. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, this is Evelyn Mullen. Thank you for your briefing. Um, I had a question, a similar question. So if, if I understand your premise, if you're microwave field is uniform, that the temperature will be uniform. But 
but that seems to be really dependent on the uniformity of the density within that volume. So my simple analogy would be if I'm trying to heat up my spaghetti and meatballs, um, it's not a uniform uh, you know, density throughout that volume that I'm heating. So, so that, how, how would you, uh, or how uniform does that uh, volume have to be in a density sense to, to really hold true to your task? Yeah, so we're actually not testing if we could make it uniform. What we're testing here is that we're trying to answer the question, is it uniform? Obviously, when you start varying densities in a material, your linear attenuation is changing. So the temperature throughout your material and how that heats up is not always going to be homogeneous. And we know that. So what we're really trying to prove here is when we're dealing with models that aren't normally homogeneous, can we see at what point we can make them? Or at what point are we saying, no, this isn't homogeneous, but that's how I want it because I'm dealing with a turbulent flow. So not necessarily trying to prove, hey, yeah, like my spaghetti and meatballs is homogeneous, but actually, no, this isn't homogeneous. It is heterogeneous, and it will never be uniform. Kind of showing that display. Does that kind of help clarify? OK, thank you. So I think um, one of the things that, that I'm thinking through here too, and again, extremely technical solution, appreciate the presentation, you guys did a great job of responding all to all the questions so far. Um, I think early on in the, in the presentation, you mentioned fiber optics, and I think to Ryan's question around software, I guess what sort of guardrails have you guys thought through around, you know, if you can't predict what um, a type of material the researchers are going to be testing with, like what sort of safety guardrails or uh, we can see, would you kind of foresee being a, an issue around um, around uh, these your products? So there are some shortcomings with our products. Obviously, because you're dealing with fiber optics, having uh, just plain air or like a gaseous uh, filament isn't going to work, right? Because you have so much movement going on and how fiber optics work, you know, they're a laser transfer, so they have to hit something. So I definitely see issues when moving forward with like complex designs in the sense of like multiple gases. Um, the idea here though is for this rudimentary design, you are gonna need to know the material you're putting in your system in order for the software to work. So I don't necessarily know if we've adapted it well enough yet. I think we could get there based off of, you know, adding a couple more like gamma spectrometry devices in order to see what is actually in our system as well. But at the moment, this is our like rudimentary prototype. Yeah, this is the minimal viable product. This is exactly. the starting point. There's a scalability that is going to come once you start the test. All yes. right, judges, thank you so much. Santos, thank you so much. All right, we're going to start transitioning to the Master Blasters, who is going to present next. And as we're transitioning again, what I want to do is I also want to spend a, a little bit of time thanking the people who helped put this on throughout the entire weekend. Um, obviously, Don and Reagan have been here throughout the entire time trying to help us out and help pull everything together. Reagan made amazing shopping runs for all the different things that we wound up getting, and I think she hit every store in the Bryan College Station area at least once yesterday, if not twice. And of course, Aaron is the most important part of everything. Have y'all been? Have y'all enjoyed the food the, this weekend? Okay, good. All right. Have, have you got? Did you get enough to eat? Yeah. All right, good. All right, all right. So everybody got enough to eat. Maybe well, we'll you know, uh, amongst the small things, the very small things that Aaron does is make sure all of that works. Uh, she does so many things in the background to make this all happen, and I just want to say thank you so much to Aaron as well as Reagan and Don throughout the entire weekend. All right, Master Blasters. Uh, again, my IRB did not cover explosions, so no explosions in the room. However, I'm really anxious to see what you're putting together. Take it away. We are the Master Blasters. Uh, my name is Madison Reuter. I am a sophomore nuclear engineer. Um, I'm Ryan Sanchez. I'm a freshman nuclear engineer. My name is Montana Welch. I'm a freshman engineering major. My name is Chida Van Zedube. I'm a master's student in biomedical engineering. I'm Eric Hartman. I'm a freshman nuclear engineer. Hey, I'm Dave Fernandez. I'm a sophomore industrial systems engineer.
atomic bomb, the most destructive weapon known to man. But what if it wasn't? The explosions of Hiroshima and Nagasaki resulted in the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people. But what if it couldn't have? What if there was a way to test infrastructure before the bombs, before the death? What if we could test your house to see if it could stand a shockwave and build a better one because of it? What if there was a safe, inexpensive, and reliable way to see the impact of shockwaves on buildings, armor, and even military vehicles so that we can make the adjustments before the catastrophe, not after? It doesn't have to be like this. We can prepare. We can be ready. We need to prevent the failure of, of infrastructure due to shockwaves. And it's not only infrastructure. It's also your home, your vehicle. We need to prevent the failure to save, ultimately save lives. So the reason why it's so hard to, to develop the technology in relation to shockwaves is because it's very hard to replicate the scenario of a shockwave. Current technology is not safe. It's not reusable, not reliable or cost effective. Our conceptions are uh, there's no shrapnel, meaning no, none of the shrapnel hit the target. It's reusable. It's made to break at certain parts, and so it's very easy to put back together. It's built on existing proven tech. We've actually redesigned a part of a rocket uh, gasket system, uh, redesigned it to, to an entirely new uh, concept. And also, it's reusable. It's very cheap, and the parts that break are very easily to replace. So in order to meet these goals, we came up with five different criteria that we would follow. Firstly, we needed the target to be safe from any shrapnel that could be flying off of our design. That way, it's a controlled test. We used uh, 500 PSI for the test, and we needed a five foot diameter uh, exit point of our design. We also needed the shockwave to last five milliseconds, so that it's an actual test. It's long enough to be studied. And we needed our design to withstand more than 20 detonations uh, using all the major parts. So this is a picture of our design. It looks like a chalice if you see it the other way around. So on the left hand side you can see like orange hinges. These are designed to break when an explosive is placed in there. So an explosive is placed in there and when it's detonated a shockwave is produced. That shockwave moves from the left to the right. So as it passes through to the right it goes through something called a throat. This causes compression of the shockwave. So as the shockwave is compressed, it's then released towards the exit and it's allowed to amplify and even multiply and increase in size to be able to achieve that 500 PSI. Then it hits the target. All of this is done in five milliseconds. And then I'll move to Montana. So we started off with this design right here. Um, essentially we were given the problem of these tubes that we currently have breaking apart upon this much pressure being shoved through them. So once we were told that they were breaking apart, we thought, okay, how can we make it to where the breaking apart is no longer a problem? So first of all, we went through disposable tubes, and we soon realized that that was going to be very, very expensive to replicate whenever you're spending $30,000 to replace a tube every time you send it through, uh, send a charge through it. So then we thought, okay, what if maybe like the crunch zones in a vehicle that are designed to break apart and crunch whenever you hit something in order to save your life, we use the same concept with the materials to say, okay, if it breaks at this point, then whenever it opens up, the kinetic energy will be used to absorb the impact where we want it to, how we want it to, and be able to be used again and rebuilt time and time again. So that's where we came up with this. Now this is an earlier design, this is just a conical shape, which we also realized would not produce the correct shockwave the way that we wanted it to do. So I will pass it along to Ryan, and he can show you. So yeah, this is an animation that we created, uh, which describes basically the process of how you would assemble our product, and then it gives a visualization of how it works in action. You see the copper pieces being ejected, and then the uh, back, back side payload being ejected backwards as well, in order to uh, just remove the force that is placed on the middle portion of the actual design, which is where the brunt of the force is felt and seen through the acceleration of the particles through the neck. What this also does is, it's an, it, what this also displays is one of the main innovations behind our product, how it breaks apart 
and how this is different from the current technology. The current technology doesn't work because it breaks. So we use the physics behind why it breaks to make it an, make it an actual advantage of our product, which is an innovation of it in and of itself. Additionally, our, this 2D render shows a visualization of how the shock waves would actually travel through our device in action, and it gives some dimensions of what it would look like, um, how general size. What it also shows is how this is an example of using proven technologies from other industries, i.e. the aerospace industry. What this looks like is uh, it's pretty similar to a rocket thruster, if you were to imagine what those look like. However, we just place it on its side and use it to create shock waves. So again, we're using proven technologies from under other industries that we know work in order to, in, in, in the context of a different situation for our product. And additionally, the product looks like a daisy, if you saw from my animation, when it is expanded, which is what the inspiration for our team name, or for our product name, Shock Daisy, came from. Finally, what we had to do is we had to run a number of calculations to ensure that this would work in actuality. Uh, given the limitations of this lab and that we weren't able to set off um, explosions, uh, we couldn't test it in actuality, but we were able to run calculations given the very same technology that NASA themselves uses um, and the equations that they provided. So we use this in order to fulfill our parameters. The first was the um, overpressure duration equation. We use this equation in order to fulfill the parameter that ha the shockwave has to last five milliseconds at the uh, point of impact. Next, we use two different equations um, working together. We use an equation to find the Mach, and we use Bernoulli's uh, equation. We use these in order to verify that as the shockwave was exiting the apparatus, it exited at 500 PSI. And finally, we use an area ratio calculation in order to determine the proper ratio between the throat and the exit of the shock wave. Um, and this also verified that with both of the given above calculations, the, uh, we would feasibly be able to make a 10 foot exit diameter work with all of our items. Um, we combined all of these together to determine what material we needed in order to make our device work. Overall, everything that we've talked about today works together in order to ensure that we can reliably test infrastructure and houses um, and military grade items. Because of this, we are able to save lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. And as we get the judges up, we will be ready for some questions. Thank you for not having any explosions in the room. I really appreciate that. That was one of my major concerns throughout this entire weekend. But nonetheless, you did a great job. Uh, interesting, interesting demonstration. All right, and we just about have most of the judges back online. There we go. All right, judges, you have five minutes for questions. Uh, I'm gonna kick off again. I guess nice, nice presentation. Um, the, as I think I understand it, you would set this up and then point it at a target. Is that, that effectively what it, the, how it's designed it to work? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so help, help, help me understand the, the, the safety aspect. I mean, it seems like you're blasting something backwards and um, I mean, how portable it is and how commercially, you know, how to use it in practice. So if you were to use this in practice, you would have to build um, some other infrastructure to place it in likely something that had padding in the walls uh, surrounding the back end of it, because that's the piece that does get ejected. It's being going to be ejected fast, but not nearly as fast as the original shockwave, because the shockwave ha would have to move a very large piece of, or multiple piece steel uh, equipment. Yeah, so effectively you, you use it in a lab simulation to test the design of a building or a car or whatever you were. Saying. Correct, yes. And the main thing to emphasize here is there are similar technologies to this, but all of them are not safe at the moment to use, even in a lab setting. So when we talk about the safety of this, we mean that this is reusable and can safely be used time and again um, in a much um, less harmful way than any of the other previously existing technologies. Sure, appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, good. Nice. I, uh, I love the portion of your presentation where you recognize that there are limitations in the designs of the current um, systems that are in place here, and you can kind of use that to your advantage to say how we can make this better. I love that. That was extremely uh, intuitive and well done. 
performance by the, by the team overall. Uh, I guess my question would be, for the systems that are currently in place, what do you think is the reason why they haven't approached this as a possible solution for, for these types of tests? So um, I can't necessarily answer why other people haven't had a similar pro thought process to us, um, but I can say that they haven't been using the technology of the um, CD thrusters that we are going to be utilizing in this, and it is because of that technology that we are able to detonate something smaller than the 500 PSI, but get a greater uh, pressure output. Um, and so it's through the use of that that we are able to um, get a much higher yield than we're putting into the system, um, essentially. And so because of that, their systems require a much larger input and therefore are more prone to failures. As far as the breakaway system, uh, I have a background in automotive. Um, I'm a certified mechanic and that was kind of where the idea came from was, okay, well if cars have areas that are designed to fail in order to prevent your death, then why couldn't something like this have an area that is designed to fail in order to take the energy out of something and create a predictable breaking point that we're able to know exactly what's going to happen without having to wonder, oh, where is this pipe going to burst or, oh, where is this um, explosion going to end up, anything like that. Everything is completely predictable and it's used in an automotive industry. So. Yeah, no, I love that. Okay, thank you. Hey, this is uh, Mark Mullen. So um, I'm sure that you're uh, all happy that there was no explosion. But should you have the opportunity, because one of the things that we actually do have at Obama are explosive firing sites, should you have the opportunity to test it with explosives, what what type of uh, test would you try to run? First of all, we'll have to test out the varying di diameters of the of throat and the exits. That's a big thing. We don't know exactly how big the throat would be in comparison to the exits because that determines the acceleration or the multiplication of the shock waves. So I'll be really interested to know how we can assure that we find that 500 PSI depending on the type of explosive we want to choose from, chemical, any different type of explosive. Thank you. All right. All right, you have time for about. You have time for one more question. All right. Um, my question kind of relates to one that Ryan asked last time. How are you going to measure the impact of it after the after you use this device? Do you have software or what? What would be the measurement? So I believe that there's already a. Uh, technologies that are put in place uh, when studies are done using the current shockwaves. The main issue we were trying to solve for was the fact that the actual tube that was delivering the shock would break every time. So it's not a matter of measuring the result, it's a matter of actually being able to produce something that gives you a result without breaking your product. Okay. All right, thank you very much, Master Velasquez. Really appreciate it. We also have a prototype that we can demonstrate later. <laughs> yeah, you guys so would like, like to see, see it afterwards? Yeah. We can do Out, that. Outside, not in the room, not in the room. All right, the next, uh, the next team is the cephalopod astronaut. And if y'all will come forward and uh, get ready for your presentation. Again, we're going to give the judges just a few minutes to fill out the form and get a chance to be able to put everything together. Uh, Again, I wanted to let you know that engineering entrepreneurship not only has these extracurricular activities like Aggie's Invent, we also offer something called a C3 certificate. C3 stands for Concept Creation and Commercialization. And what we do is we provide courses as well as in encounter and having some of your courses count towards this certificate that would then go on your resume. This is an opportunity for you to put these kinds of things on your resume because recruiters are looking for Aggies Invent type activities because you've demonstrated what you've been able to do in a very short period of time. They're also looking for entrepreneurial mindset and entrepreneurial skills. That's the kinds of things that we are putting together in engineering entrepreneurship. We would love to engage with you at any point in time and at any point in your college career. This is kind of the first step. 
but let us help you continue on in your journey. All right, cephalopod astronauts, take it away. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are the cephalopod astronauts. Uh, my name is Reese Pardo. I'm a first year engineering student. My name is Lam Tran, I'm a junior, majoring in electrical engineering. My name is Matthew Grimm. I'm an industrial engineering student. My name is Elias Ramos. I'm a senior nuclear engineering student. My name is Udit Parikh, and I'm a sophomore mechanical engineering major. And my name is Kevin Wang, and I'm currently a junior in industrial and system engineering. Humans are driven by discovery, especially with general relativity pushing the boundaries of classical physics. It followed from the special theory of relativity. General relativity. Einstein's theory of relativity. We call it space-time. Special relativity. General relativity is all about... If you find yourself in the vicinity of a higher source of gravity, then Einstein might be wrong. In order to prove Einstein's theory right, NASA launched a operation called Gravity Probe B, which costed millions of dollars. Now imagine doing this on a commercial level. Introducing Cryo-Z, a operating system suitable for superconduction sensors. Passive louver system that deflects 94% of radiation. A heat sink using phase change material in addition to active laser cooling. Revolutionizing satellite thermal control on a small scale. Capable of keeping operation temperature as low as 4 Kelvin. Empowering physicists to unlock the secrets of the universe. Design here is a way of sending uh, a small sensor uh, that is very temperature controlled in space and keep it at specified temperature consistently over a long period of time. Uh, we ended up focusing on a squid device, uh, which is a temp uh, device that's used to uh, measure uh, magnetic fields and uh, put it into a small satellite and launch it into space. Uh, what we can do with this information that the squid provides back to us. Um, because it measures the magnetic field around the Earth, and we can also use it to measure the uh, space-time curvature of the Earth. Uh, this has applications in various fields, such as like space geodesy, which can help us improve um, GPS devices. Uh, it could potentially measure gravitational waves, um, which theoretical physicists could use to measure the, um, the bigger scope of the universe. And quantum physicists can use this um, as, for the space-time implications of how photons interact with each other. Um, to make this product, uh, we had to commit to five very strict constraints. In developing the Cryo-Z, we identified that we need a constant temperature of 4 kelvins. The system must use uh, 30, 31 watts of power or less. The form factor needs to be 1.5 U's, which is the size of a shoebox, and this, it needs to survive five years at low Earth orbit, <coughs> all for a low cost. So in our approach for regulating the temperature, we decided to use a microscope approach. The way a microscope gets a good image is force you to, first you do a force <coughs> adjustment. It gives you roughly 90% of the way there. Then you fine tune it to get exactly the amount of focus you need for a good photo. We applied this to our thermal system by using a passive cooling as the core stop and active cooling as the fine knob. Our passive cooling works using loopers, which you can think of as thermal shutters, with a very reflective surface on the actual shutter part. And we combine this with the latent heat storage, which uses phase shifting material to store heat without raising the average temperature of our satellite. It takes advantage of orbital periods, so when we're in sunlight, we're reflecting as much heat as possible, and then the heat that we do accumulate, we vent off when we're in the Earth's shadow. This gets us 
90% of the way there, about 40 degrees Kelvin. To get all the way down to 4 degrees Kelvin, we use our active system. So our passive thermal control system does a really efficient job at keeping energy out from seeping inside of the satellite. However, during the course of our operation, heat will eventually get inside our cryo tank. And so we need some form of active thermal control system to remove the heat whenever we need to and, to and whenever we want to. And the reason being is because we do not want to disrupt or we do not want to disrupt the, the squid measurement uh, timeline and operation. And so we decided for our active thermal system to use laser cooling. Laser cooling is a really, really interesting concept because it can actually potentially cool down atoms down to less than four Kelvin. And so we can maintain tolerances for our operating temperature of four plus 0 0.2 Kelvin. We can actually maintain that. Combining these two components, we created the Cryo Z. <coughs> On the right side, you could see the front facing and the right face of the, of the satellite. At the front face, we have the configuration of the louvers at which it would be on the sunny side of Earth. The louvers are facing down and they're reflecting as much radiation as possible. On the right side, we have the louvers in the configuration they would be on the dark side of the Earth. They are opened up to the radiators in the back and are expelling heat as fast as they can. Now on the left image, we have the interior of the satellite. You could see a chamber in the middle which houses the squid it's supported with four support beams that attach to an aluminum chassis. And the very bottom of our satellite holds our latent heat, heat storage mechanism. Now for, there's, there's many different factors, there's many unpredictable factors when it comes to launching a satellite, especially a small satellite, a CubeSat, onto space. So to account for those factors, We've built, our development team has built additional features uh, in order to support our squid. Number one, for, to ensure a secure launch onto space, like, like we talked about before, we have built a, a, a trust structure supporting the chamber which houses the squid. And number two, to counter all the harsh conditions in space, uh, we've uh, built this glass coating which is going to be minimizing your oxidation and corrosion while in the low Earth orbit. So these are some of the key additional features we've added on in order to optimize our squid performance. And finally, the cost of this system. Now the average cost of sending such a small satellite onto space uh, on the low end is currently now $10 million. Now the estimated cost of our system would be about $20,000. Now compare that amount of money to $10 million, this amount is quite minimal, all right? And number two, we also are creating a system that, that are suitable for many different superconducting sensors with many different applications in the future, not only in, in terms of uh, proving Einstein's theory about relativity, but also we could use this for precise measurements for any scientific field, for any superconductors. Now, this, we've concluded our presentation on Cryo-Z. Now we are empowering the next generation of scientific measurement. Now we're open up the uh, floor to any questions. All right, Master. I mean, uh, thank you all so much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm confused on the team. Like, uh, we'll bring the judges up here in just a second, and then we'll give you five minutes for um, for questions. And here we go. Uh, All right, judges. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, hi. I'm sorry. Uh, I have a question. When you were talking about using your uh, passive and active systems in combination with uh, where the satellite is in respect to the shadow from the Earth, how do you? Um, I wasn't quite sure I understood how you keep the temperature constant in that rotation. Okay, so we use a phase shifting material, which if you think about it, it's like the most common phase shifting that everyone knows is water. When you have ice and it melts, it can become water that's also at 32 degrees Celsius, or Fahrenheit, sorry. 
So through that process, it's gaining heat, but it's not changing its temperature. We found the material paraffin wax that at the temperatures we're operating at, it can absorb heat without changing its temperature. And do you need me to elaborate more? Any follow-up question? Okay, uh, that's very helpful. And then uh, you based this on one, uh, one equipment, the squid that you're trying to maintain the temperature on. And so if, um, if you were trying to address multiple um, uh, multiple uh, chips or systems and uh, satellite would need multiple units. Is that, is that true? Yes, that's true. So uh, our, our idea was uh, we could adjust the internals of the device. So right now we're using liquid helium to get it down to about four degrees Kelvin. Uh, but we could change uh, the internals depending on what device we're using um, and regulate the temperature at a set range uh, depending on the device that we need to send up. Okay, thank you. Talk to me a little bit about the, uh, the sustainability side of things. I mean, off the top, you said you were looking to, to have something that could, could last five years. Um, that didn't jump out at me as you guys just went through your presentation. Just how the, the, you know, the entire setup would, would sustain, including the, the helium, you know, and not, not lose coolant effectively. Yeah, so, so in order to maintain an operation lifetime of five years, our biggest area of concern and, and honestly our main approach is to just not let any heat conduct inside. And so that's why we uh, place a, an enormous emphasis on many passive control systems because there's no input of heat. There's no, um, when you're using passive thermal systems, you don't have to have an electricity requirement. And so we have the radiators, we have the uh, louviers, and then we have that uh, PCM, that phase change material, which will, for the most part, not, it will not allow for heat to generate inside. And in terms of like the laser system, that laser system is, uh, that's why we kind of use a microscope analogy because it's supposed to be a fine point. We're not supposed to be using it all the time. The passive system should be sufficient enough so that we only use the lasers when it's absolutely necessary. So we have a certain power constraint and we most likely might attach even a, a small microcontroller to turn on the laser and to turn it off. Um, but yeah, we won't be able to run the laser every single day for five years. That's, that's just simply unfeasible. But that's why we emphasize the, the passive control systems as the main approach. Any, uh, I guess, kind of going on power control comment, right? Any, any mitigation strategies that you feel like you need to be investigated to be able to make this a viable solution? Yeah, so I know for a fact uh, that CUBE satellites have certain power cycles that they operate. They're not always on 24-7. So I think if we want to continue working with this project, we need to essentially figure out effective strategies as to what would be an ideal power system for our specific CUBE satellite. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's awesome that you guys immediately went into over the weekend and you only had two days, but it's something uh, <coughs> All right, you have uh, time for one more question, judges. Um, so I have to. Uh, say, I've been working with a company in New Mexico called Star, Star Cryoelectronics for um, a couple of years, and they do switch systems that still don't understand what they do. So this is a little bit difficult for me to get my. Um, but one of the questions I have is, as you're using helium as well, do you have a system for the off-gassing of the helium, or how does that work with the, the passive system? Uh, can you repeat that? I, I couldn't. I'm sorry. So since you're using helium, um, I, I wasn't clear on if there was off-gassing of the helium, how you would deal with that. Off-gassing. So, Essentially what we're doing is we have a helium in the center chamber. We have liquid helium in the center chamber. And we have, uh, we have streams of liquid helium-3 um, going through pipes surrounding the chamber. And those li that, that liquid helium-3 that's flowing through those channels is being hit by the laser, which is cooling it down. And so the heat goes from the helium inside the chamber 
to the helium in the streams, and that helium is being cooled. Okay. And does it ever leave or get gas? It, it, or do we stay at the liquid? If we use helium four on these tiny little things, since we're, I, I believe that the super, it becomes a superfluid at 2.17 Kelvin, um, which we're not trying to operate because at that point the viscosity, there's essentially no viscosity, so you have to just like leave. Um, it's it's pretty, it's a really weird quantum phenomenon, and so, but we we won't try to um, cool it down that much. We'll just essentially, for the operating temperature, it's supposed to be at four Kelvin. Uh, let's just say for one. Day, it's like at 7 Kelvin. Oh, we'll just heat, cool it down to 3 Kelvin and induce a heat flux so that we can conduct it out. And um, that's the amount of time that we have. Thank you very much, Cephalopod astronauts. <laughs> As we get ready for the next team, Revolve, we will again remind everyone here that uh, we're going to ask you to help us clean up at the end of the weekend because. Um, <laughs> We like to, we want to reuse the room and the facilities and things like that, so we need to leave it better than we found it. So we're going to ask you to help us get things taken care of. Again, after the last presentation, we have two more presentations. After the last presentation, I'll disappear for a few minutes. You're going to go out and get a group shot, and then we'll be back and announce the winners. Just to remind you, the winning team wins $1,000. And the way this works is we will place it in your student account. Uh, again, the thousand dollars is for the team. Second place team is 750, and the third place team is 500. We'll divide that among the team members, and then we'll deposit that in your student accounts. Love to give you cash. Unfortunately, the university doesn't allow me to do that. Um, it becomes tax. It comes all kinds of crazy things. So the best I can do is to put it in your student account, and you could you, you'll see it as a scholarship. It'll wind up in your uh, accounts in the uh, next couple of days. Question. Yes. Will it get towards our COA? Your COA. I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll, if it uh, if, if that becomes an issue, talk to us. Okay. Great. I I didn't know the answer to that question. All right. Well, now I, I think I've stalled long enough for our judges to fill out the form, and so team resolve, take it away. And there's your clicker. Hi, my name is Bangs Hugh Genge. I'm a junior chemical engineering major. Uh, hello, I'm Emmanuel Trueva, and I am a freshman engineering student. Hello, my name is Henry Tarter, and I'm a sophomore nuclear engineering student. Hi, my name is Dick Vijay, and I'm a first year master's student in mechanical engineering. Uh, hello, everyone, my name is Aksha, and I'm doing my master's in electrical engineering. And we are uh, Revolve. Revolve. Currently, there is no devices available to test the high G-forces experienced by spacecrafts and missiles during launch and re-entry in dual axes, and we would like to tell you more about this in our video. Well, let me tell you what makes a rocket hard. Uh, the, the energy and the velocity required to get into orbit it is, is so substantial uh, that compared to, say, a car or even a plane, uh, the, you have almost no margin to play with. The videos you have just seen are the culmination of decades of technological innovation that cost billions to research and launch. Even with the large funds sunk into these projects, there is still uncertainty until the moment of launch. The technology available to us simply isn't capable of faithfully reproducing the intensity experienced during launch and re-entry. The closest we can get to are centrifuges that spin their test articles up to 200 Gs of acceleration only about a vertical axis. This means that we don't get the invaluable data acquired at launch when testing equipment on Earth, resulting in expensive test flights spaced too far apart with too little data acquired per launch, we need something that can more accurately represent spaceflight in two axes. At Revolve, we can reproduce these conditions on Earth, thus saving large sums of money and allowing for more testing and data collection over smaller time frames and reducing overall price by using a newly designed dual-axis centrifuge, accelerating the engineering process and making accurate testing more available for a smaller price tag. Or Revolve, bring the future on a spin. with these constraints. Um, the first one being that we are achieving 200 Gs of acceleration on the primary axis of rotation. This figure on its own 
is pretty significant, but not particularly unique. Where it gets interesting is that we also bring 75 g's of acceleration on the secondary axis of rotation. Um, and what is interesting about this is that it's on a secondary axis, something that allows us to test magnitudes of acceleration previously impossible to test uh, on Earth-based systems. And we do this with a payload mass of up to 15 kilograms and a maximum payload volume of 0.1 meters cubed, and all staying within a 6 meters squared footprint, uh, meaning that uh, it can be put within a small facility, meaning that you don't need a large space to operate it, reducing implementation costs, and also staying with under a 100 kilogram maximum system weight, meaning that it can be transported and relocated and take testing to where it needs to be. So we considered some different designs when we were building our prototype. The first one was the spinning truss design. One problem we ran into was that most centrifuges start on one fixed point. So we decided to try a two fixed point system where the mass would spin around on a truss-like structure, but we discarded this idea because of the extreme force that would be on the diagonal beams. The second design was the two-arm design, which we thought would be pretty good, but in the end, the arm was so long and so heavy that it would start overweighing our restrictions and we had to discard it. Therefore, we went with the third design, which is the one-arm design, basically playing the central mass on the motors and then the secondary motor would drive the crankshaft on the arm and then the single motor will turn it down here. And we have a working prototype. Yeah, so if you can able to visualize, this is our secondary axis, it's going like this, and this is our primary axis, you can also so I hope this helps you understand what we are going to try and how we are going to try it. So, we're going to move on to the design process. Yeah, so that's been the same. So, now we are going to know more technical details, so how are we going to achieve this? So. I think it's pretty simple, but it's not simple with the given constraint. So we started by placing the, all the uh, bulky instrument into the center, but still we are system is uh, even bulky. So in stage one, we got around 280 kgs, and we want to be within 100 kgs. So it's too too more. So then we decided to use the weight of the secondary motor as a offset. Sorry, at, at offset. So we can reduce our counter mass weight and we can use the weight of the uh, uh, secondary motor as a counter mass. But still, the moment of inertia is more and more moment of inertia, that means uh, more torque and more power and that means more HP of motors. And more HP of motor means more weight. So it's still going around weights. So now, this is our final design which we are proposing. And as you can see in the schematics, so there are a few technicalities. Uh, so we are proposing that uh, we will be using a conical arm and it will be supported by a conical bearing so it can withstand both axial and uh, longitudinal forces. So what are the benefits in our design? So first, we have used the mechanism of the gear mechanism and the secondary motor has a counter mass weight. So we don't need additional weight to put on the other end to balance the system. Second, we have a hollow shaft. That means we have a more torsional stability so it will not tear apart at higher RPM. And second, third one is a conical shape. So we have a larger cross-section area at the base, so it can able to sustain more weight, and it can able to overhang a more weight at the end. And uh, we are proposed with a uh, calculation. We come up that we can use this aluminum grade 7075. It's an aerospace material because it provides a light weight and also a more strength. And just I said earlier, we started with 280 kg, and now we are at 120 kg. And these are some system sizes you can look at at the reference. Some applications of this design is that we can accurately simulate the forces within re-entry of a spacecraft on Earth. We know that sending a rocket to space is expensive, but we need an accurate way to replicate this on Earth that is cheap and cost effective. That is where our two-axis centrifuge takes place. It's cheap and we don't have to send things to space and we don't have to worry about the risk of things being damaged on re-entry. The second application is military applications, i.e. IBCMs, which basically intercept missiles and in order to do that, they have to move very fast, very quickly. That means high acceleration, which could in, in turn damage parts, which will allow, and that is where the centrifuge comes in to test that, because it can create high Gs on multiple different axes to see how the tech, how the equipment would respond. Okay, next comes the business impact. So why is it cost efficient? So the main reason for building this model is nothing but to test the how reliable the electronic components are. Since under very high gravity, 
the electronic components are being subjected to very high stress. So it's uh, so basically to test that. So when we can make the very high G conditions and test it right here. So the reliability of these components when sent to the space would be very high. And the data that we are getting back would be very much reliable, which comes under the value. And why is it an innovator? Uh, it's uh, basically a two axis centrifuge and uh, we are able to, uh, we are testing it under very high G conditions. All right, so what's next? So with given time and resources, we can further design our system to become more effective and become more lightweight so that it can be more commercialized and be more, it can be made industrialized to all companies. So this can benefit the aerospace community, the community and the way that everything is sent into space and the way that uh, things are dealt under high G circumstances. And from proof of concept, we can go to our prototype design where we can actually make a physical uh, simulate a physical copy of this scaled up so it can actually work and then once the prototype is ready it's been tested it's been proven that it works and that we have uh, successfully used technology in there without destroying it we can commercialize it and release it to the public so we are revolve bringing the future on the spin thank you we are ready for Q&A all right thank you revolve all right we'll get the judges up and going and then we'll give y'all five minutes for questions. Hopefully your head is spinning. Oh, sorry, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't stand it, I couldn't stand it. All right, judges, five minutes for questions. I'll start. Thank you. I'll start. I'll start. Uh, prototype is pretty fantastic. Can you zoom in? No, no, there's a way to yeah, it was yeah, I can someone zoom in on it. I thought it might be a little harder to visualize. Is there yeah, any chance I can zoom in on Oh, there we go, there we go, there we go. Yeah. Test it Can you just turn it on? Yeah. Hold on to it. This is for the primary axis. Yeah. Yeah. And this is for secondary. Somehow this wiring got off, so yeah. you can't able to show the rotation of this axis, but it is rotating. Oh. Yeah, it is. There we go. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the, the prototype is great. I think the, the part that I'm trying to bridge is, you know, what, where would this be housed necessarily? Is this, is this something that, you know, because you guys brought Elon into it, is it something that Tesla would have at their, at their you know, uh, facilities and as they bring in new, uh, new vessels or um, for combustion fluids? And, uh, right, also, so... Um, that's what we were trying to get out with the small footprint because it only has a six meter squared footprint it's a relatively small space meaning that it's quite versatile in where you can place it as long as you um, either take safety precautions to keep people out of harm's way should anything go wrong which is unlikely um, or build a uh, pop-up facility around it just in case to catch debris or anything that might fly off Sure. And so does that scale up to the needs of what an actual spacecraft would, would require? Or is this for something smaller scale, like, I don't know. No, like, uh, uh, I can take this question. So, when, so given the constraint, it's within the six meter square and also within a hundred kg. But yes, we are proposing the design that can able to generate a 200 gram gravitational force on primary axis and 75 gravitational force on secondary axis and I think we can able to do that within the given constraint in a small size. Thank you. Well done again. So my question kind of revolves around the same way. What would be the cost or what are you, what is your anticipated cost to get to scale a, a actual um, working product? So the thing is actually we didn't care much about the cost because this is one of the kind of a centrifuge still it is not that out in the market so we are trying still dealing with the, the major challenge here is to bring within a hundred kg constraint so still we need some more resources and time to work upon so we can get the system optimized to can reduce it to hundred kg but uh, given a uh, cost effectiveness so it will not be much more cost Costly because we are still using uh, con uh, conventional motors which are out in the market. The, the major cost content will be coming from the material we are using. It's an aluminum grade 7. It's an aerospace material that can be a bit costly. But sorry, we don't have any specific number to give to you. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Any other questions? Yeah, I'm fine with the Bevlin. Um, so I had a question with, the first time I like to say, always assume something can go wrong. <laughs> so the safety discussion, right? There's there's always a chance that the equipment or what you're testing can fail. So uh, good life lesson. From the perspective, okay. So from the perspective of doing something different, new with respect to a two-axis um, centrifuge design. I'm wondering if you've thought about what other advances in simulation or data collection, data telemetry, those types of things you might need to evolve uh, to go with the new testing methodology. Uh, honestly, uh, may I? Uh, yes, uh, actually, like, uh, so we will actually need to uh, get to know the acceleration data. So for that, there is actually a transmitting board and a receiver board. Uh, so for that, uh, the transmitter board and the receiver board, they usually at the same frequency. Uh, there's actually an analog to digital converter. So once uh, it is being converted from analog to digital form for the transmission purposes. Uh. Okay, judges and team, thank you so much for your presentation thank you. and for your thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, we're going to end um, in the flight team, and this is a team that's going to kind of round out exactly what we've got going on here. One of the programs that I want to mention to you as students is something that's funded by the National Science Foundation. It's called the i program. And in the i program, what you can do is to take your ideas, and we run an i program three times a year in spring semester, fall semester and then during the summer. And you would form a team, two people would form a team, and we would provide you through the NSF funding $3,000 to do customer discovery on your idea. Now it can be an idea out of Aggies and Bent. It can be an idea or something along the lines that you have as a startup that you'd like to put together. But the National Science Foundation is acu acutely interested in taking fundamental research and fundamental ideas and helping people commercialize them. And that's the way and that's the reason that we are putting that program together and then offering that. It also allows you to qualify for the National i -Corps program. And the National i -Corps program provides you with $50,000 of money to com help commercialize something. So if you're interested in that, I encourage you to look at the iSight program Google TAMU iSight program, you'll find that or contact me and we'll be able to get you involved in that. One last plug, up on the fourth floor we have an incubator and we're happy to help you in any way possible, whether it's this idea or some other way that you'd like to explore a startup. All right, let's move on to the flight team and um, we'll allow you all to take it away. Howdy. 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 Well, uh, we're the data acquisition team, and uh, welcome. We're a flight team, but uh, we're working on the data acquisition telemetry problem. Hi. Oh. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeffrey. I'm from industrial engineering. I'm Jason. I'm a first year engineering. I'm Noam. I'm also first year engineering. I'm Subir. I'm first year graduate in mechanical. I'm Justin, senior computer engineering. Has anyone here ever had a warning from their car? Maybe you had a low tire pressure, or maybe your car engine was running a little hot. Those can help you in times of need. Now, what if that warning was actually for a rocket? Or what if there wasn't a warning at all? Let's find out. If it can go wrong, it will. And that's being optimistic with rockets. You have a group of scientists working day and night for years on end. Working late nights, they finally finish the design. Rocky gets sent to impact to collect the data. Everyone is anxious, waiting for the data to come in. It impacts. 
They look for the data. It's not there. They notice that the data infrastructure is from the 2000s with low data rate and high latency. Now what can we do about it, they thought. First, the rocket collects the data using flexible sensor configurations, then uses machine learning to predict significant events. After, it simplifies and compresses before sending to an existing network of satellites, Starlink. Finally, it's interpreted by ground control. With good communications, a computer model can be developed to prevent malfunctions for successful flights. Rockets are very fast. They can go up to 17,000 miles per hour. With, with, a fast, with, a, with a speed, retrieving data can be tricky because they're going very fast, and today's technology has high latency, the current technology that they're using has high latency, and the data analysis tools are not good enough. You may ask, why do we need this data? Well, you know, you know I'm pretty sure you know about AI, and we developed this AI with getting data. This data can be used to improve success of next missions, improve how we explore space and all other things. Our design is to implement fast, we, is to implement all the things in our system, including fast microprocessor that can process, that can process a task within two nanoseconds, sensors that can report data points within 10 nan nanoseconds, reliable, secure global communication systems, fast algorithms to read and send data from sensors to ground control, robust data analysis for visualization and, and machine learning. Our first possible design was taking the sun and using it as a radio signal bridge. Basically, from the sounding rocket, you're taking the radio signal and amplifying it to send down to the ground station. But we didn't use this method because it was too experimental. The second possible design was taking a black box of all of the raw data and sending it off before impact and having it descend to the correct coordinates. We didn't use this because it would be too expensive and hard to put together to do this whole process. But instead we chose a new innovative way. And this new innovative way is an encrypted satellite communication network also known as Starlink. This is a low earth orbit satellite that can communicate with just about anywhere across the globe. So it fits our criteria for one, being global, and two, being able to communicate with all, all parties that need access. Before sending off the data, we would simplify the data on the sounding rocket and compress it so that before it sends, the file size is smaller and it would transmit much faster. We would also have the common sensors on the sounding rocket, as well as a flexible se sensor configuration box, so the sounding rocket could have adaptability for multiple launches. In our prototype, we used uh, a Raspberry Pi as our microprocessor. So this is essentially a, a computer, and we connect it through SSH, which is a secure shell. We basically have two computers connecting to each other where one can write can read and write to each other without any delays. And our telemetry dashboard is telling us what's going on with all the data. Uh, we don't want to look at a CSV of just random numbers. We rather quantify it and look at what's important. Several sensors are employed for the boost, guidance, and attitude control of the payload. So the sensors are employed for various purposes such as monitoring and controlling variables like position and velocity about each of the axes and rotation about them. Sometimes magnetometers are used to study the Earth's magnetic field with altitude. Altimeter measures the altitude and garometer measures the rotation about each of the axes of the aerial vehicle. 
But what, what, why? You know, why are we doing this and, and what's it for? Well, it's to upgrade the current technology that's on these sounding rockets. The current communication networks that's on them is from the year 2000. Uh, this was before global satellite internet was a thing. And it's also before very high microprocessors could process data at speeds they can in today's day and age. So about, about the applications, we can not only apply our system to the sounding rocket, we can also apply to the missile and uh, general rocket, even for the space vessels. So who are our target customers? Uh, the sounding rocket buyers are, and the scientists who want to do research uh, to improve the development of sounding rocket also are. So about the future plans, the first we will uh, implement the robust test uh, during like design of experiment, sensitivity analysis, reliable analysis, etc. to validate and calibrate our system. And then we can just uh, upgrade and improve the data analysis features to assist the payroll missions and to uh, support real-time system control. So we can help to um, bring the help the sounding rocket to go to the big data error. Thank you, and uh, are there any questions? Great job, thank you very much. All right, we'll get the judges set up, and then we will allow them to have five minutes for questions. There we go. All right, judges, you've got five minutes for questions. Nice, nice presentation, Dave. Um, you mentioned it a couple times, machine learning, and, and I guess I'm, I'm not clear on how that integrates into the solution you guys are proposing. Can you just talk a little bit more, bit more on how you plan on that to work or function? Yeah, uh, with the machine learning tools, uh, when we collect this data, we download it into the system because uh, well, where our applications are used in the systems rockets or missiles where we know they're likely not coming back. So um, our, sys our design would help us save the data on our local system. Then we visualize that data. We, we use machine learning tools for like future, for future pre for predictions of what's gonna happen in the future. Let's say uh, the rocket blew, like did not reach the target and blew up, like why did it, why did it blow up? We can use the telemetry system to read what was happening, like time, seconds before that. Okay, I think I understand. So it's, it's not on the acquisition side, it's on the eventual usage for continuous improvement. Yes, so, so it's, acquisi we, it's acquisition and then using it. Okay, appreciate it, thank you. So I um, also, Tech, I think it's a great presentation. Um, I definitely, I love seeing the design alternatives that you guys had. I thought the first two were extremely innovative. Um, I think the big assumption on the third one is that this kind of network of, of satellites is in place. Do you, how have you guys considered that? That if this is a system that we want to you know, implement today, what we work around? Yes, yeah, so one of our assumptions would be that uh, your company would uh, engage in a private uh, partnership with uh, Starlink to get uh, military access to their um, satellites through uh, their own antenna that they would build for your microcontroller. Uh, just because uh, the only other way to connect to the Starlink network is through their dish that they make themselves. Okay, and so then with that in mind, you know, uh, kind of investment, I guess, that would look like from uh, companies to help get to help get started, like you know, up and operational, and what that look like. Uh, I'm sorry. What, what was your question? What What does what look like? The investment that would be required. Um, I'm I'm not too sure on, on the question. Um, I would have to get back to you on that one. I'll, I'll put it another way. Overall system, we're talking about a set of. Um, set of sensors and then connection to the Starlink network. Have you guys done a cost estimate around what 
that system would, would amount to what the total cost is? Uh, we, we haven't looked at how much it costs to have starlings on our system, but we have looked at how much it costs to get microprocessors and sensors. So it would be like within 100 bucks for like hardware without labor and having all like other miscellaneous stuff. But uh, for statics, because it will require more research and more like authority to, to use their network with, without using that like uh, commercial net network. Got it, okay, thank you. All done. Great presentation. I have a question. How do you anticipate securely storing and transmitting the data? For, for our prototype, we used uh, SSH. Uh, as we said, our system will, previous, system, pre previous systems were using microcontrollers, but uh, what we are building right now, we want to use microprocessors, which are like full grown computers which you can SSH into and have that instant data access. All right, time for one more question if you have it. Hi, this is that one moment. Uh, my question would be on uh, testing your, your uh, proposal. Have you envisioned like a, some sort of a small scale intermediate uh, Tests you could do before um, someone might, you know, go full scale with it on a on a rocket and Starlink network. Uh, we did when we when we were trying out our prototype design. Um, we where we were successful uh, reading the sensors and all that stuff. We weren't we, we did not have rockets to test on like obviously and um, maybe other big sensors, but uh, I'm pretty sure um, so far what we built, we can just add onto, we can just add stuff onto that, and then we have something. Okay, thank you very much, I appreciate it. All right, flight team, what we're going to be doing now is we are going to be uh, going to, I'm gonna go off and talk to the judges for a few minutes, don't forget, y'all are going to go out and go on the steps over there, get a group shot, and we will be right back with you in a few minutes.
satellite hardware. Sure you do. Uh, many instruments on launch, so we have some interesting um, environmental testing capabilities, some laboratory spaces for that as well. So yeah, that's pretty we uh, actually had a, a New Mexico Small Business Business Program where the lady came and used our explosive laboratory to explode her heart. She built um, metal or gonky things, and part of her art installation was the nine different ways that they blew up her. Wow. Do they know it was called Meow Wolf over Santa Fe? <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> cool to see it. We got to go watch an explode a couple of them. It's fun. That's cool. That's really cool. Yeah, that's just something like that. It'd be interesting to see the, the slow mo cam on the, on the middle. Uh huh. See, I told you I'd be right back, didn't I? There he is. <laughs> <laughs> and the students are coming right back in. They're just learning how we blow things up, right? Oh, exactly. I got to tell you, Los Alamos Labs is a really cool place. I've been there a couple of times, and it's a really, it's a great place to go. No, you can't out there just the right amount of time. It's perfect. Okay, guys, stop. He's ready to do it. All right, come on in. Let's uh, let's announce the winners. Let's announce the winners. And as I said before, Rodney will make you the prizes after you release them. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so again, the winning teams. All right, what we're going to do is we're going to announce the third place. And, and we have Vanna White here handing us the, <laughs> the checks. All right, now, just, just so that you ladies and gentlemen know, this is a check. But it's not currency. Oh. <laughs> okay, even though it's signed by, if you notice, it was signed by now President Banks, right? She was, at the time, she was the dean, but now it's President Banks. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to announce the, the teams, and we'll start at the third place. And again, you'll receive $500 in your student account uh, divided amongst the team. I will tell you that this was one of the hardest Aggies and Vince to judge that there has been. Y'all did an outstanding job and there was not a lot of difference between some of you and, and I really had to pin the judges down a lot of uh, very closely to try to make some decisions. So what we'll have you do is we'll have you stand up here uh, when I announce your team, stand up here and we're going to get a picture of you with the check and then um, you can take the check, you can hold the check for a while and make some selfies and take some pictures if you want to. Please return it to us. It's not cashable, so return it to us. We like to reuse, return, reuse, and recycle, so like we're going to use these again. Um, then afterwards, the winning teams will ask you to step outside um, and um, take care and get an interview. All right, so without further ado, the, the white-haired guys talked way long enough. What we're going to do is we're going to announce the third place team and offer you congratulations. And the third place team is Revolve. And I am not Vanna White. All right, here you go. <laughs> Did you get it? Okay, great. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you, judges. You. <laughs> all right, congratulations. So hang on to it so you can take some pictures. Congratulations. All right. And the second place team is Kraken. I would like to, I believe, if I'm not correct, y'all are all freshmen, is that correct? Yes, sir. All right, congratulations. Here you go, take it, take it, take, take the check. Congratulations, Kraken. Great job on your presentation. Congratulations. Congratulations, nice and done. Thank you.
All right, finally, in the, the, the first place team and the team that walks away with the $1,000 in their account is Master Black. Yes! <laughs> that was an explosive reaction. There you go. Thank you. I love you guys. Let's go, man. I love you guys. Let's go. Explosive reactions are allowed. <laughs> Yeah, move yeah, yeah, yeah. to me. Hold it. Now all hands on. All hands on the shed. <laughs> Hold on, hold on. We gotta, we gotta do the dancing gig. What? We gotta do. Uh, oh, we gotta do the one. A one. A one. A one. A one. Oh, good one. gracious. Uh, <laughs> all right, congratulations, all three of this team. Again, everything that y'all learned throughout this entire weekend is applicable to your academic, especially your careers as you go into industry. Thank you very much for your time. Judges, thank you so much for everything that you have done for us and really appreciate all the time and effort and everything that you've done. Thank you so much. Y'all have a great rest of the weekend. Students, remember, classes start tomorrow. Sorry. At least midterms are over. All right. Hi. Can I just say one thing? Yes, ma'am. Please go right ahead. And this, um, I, we didn't coordinate this, but so on behalf of all the judges, you all did a fantastic job on your your projects, um, presentations, in a very short period of time, working on problems that are very, very challenging problems. So I just wanted to say kudos to everybody for the efforts that they put in. Um, you know, we work. Uh, tirelessly in these types of problems all the time at the Fellows National Laboratory with teams of interdisciplinary scientists and engineers and technicians to come up with workable solutions and we know these are all very challenging to do. Should you be interested in working on projects like this in the future, I did just want to mention that we're found on hired uh, student interns every year and we'd love to see some of you there. We do work in all of these areas as it turns out. So I just put in that plug. Yeah, let me offer a plug. Los Alamos National Labs is a fabulous intern program. So if you're interested in this, they've got a tremendous intern program. Right, Marianne? Yes, that is correct, Rod. Yes. <laughs> Anything else anybody else would like to say? I'll just put the plug in. I'll just also echo Ellen's thoughts. You, did, you all did a very nice job. And um, I think back when I was a student, I'm not sure I could have ever pulled something off like this. Um, so I, I really commend, commend the effort and the, the, uh, the creativity. And I'll also put a shameless plug in that Accenture does do internships as well. So uh, <laughs> feel free to reach out to Obi or myself or any of us uh, on LinkedIn to, to connect. So thanks. All right. Again, thank you so much. Obi, do you want to say anything in final? No, I'm just. Congrats, everyone. Uh, it's, it's truly impressive what every team was able to pull off in, in short, waiting hours, right? And the presentations were all uh, top notch. So, no shown. kidding. Also, no kidding. We've had the absolute. We've had the pleasure of working with y'all. We've really enjoyed it throughout this entire time. Let's keep things going, keep staying connected with engineering entrepreneurship. Don't hesitate to come back to another Aggies event. We'll do one in January, February, and April. April of first responders, January is veterinary medicine, and February is special because it's a Aggies event held around the world. Thank you all very much. Have a great rest of the weekend. Don't forget to help us clean up, and we appreciate all your time and effort here.